Your ring is not a piece of jewelry. It projects the electrical energy of your nervous system into the physical world. Without his ring, a sorcerer is powerless. The only other thing a sorcerer needs is a nice pair of pointy shoes. Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is, wait, you haven't seen? It's a show where we talk about movies and specifically talk about a movie at least one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. This is episode number 282, and it is week three of Cage of Palooza 2024. We are watching 2010's The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and here to talk with me about it, it's Jonathan Bush. Jonathan, how you doing? I'm doing all right, Travis. How are you? I am doing quite well. So Cage of Palooza 2024, we talked a little while ago because um, you were on. We talked to October Sky yeah. and then um, Sky, yeah. off air, we, we talked about, hey, you need to, we, you should come back for, for Cage yeah, of Palooza. I would, I would be, yeah, I would, I would be, I would be honored if you would find a spot for lowly me in your iconic Cage of Palooza, I said, sir. Um, <laughs> and you said, I have an opening. And I said, you know what? I keep hearing about Peggy Sue got married, and I'm thinking to myself, I I, I remember Crybaby, which I know is a different film, but still period piece, whatever. And I, I would like, like, or like that 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 vibe kind of tying it in with with our last movie, with sure. Cover Sky. And but I was like, you know, let's see what else is available. And you said, how about Sorcerer's Apprentice? And I looked up the poster. And I saw Nick Cage with his long hair as the wizard. That's all I saw. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> the funny thing is, the first movie you had me on was Identity. And you just handed me that movie. You said this mm-hmm. movie would be excellent in your hands. Please take care of it. And I said, sure. And it had Alfred Molina in a central role. And here again, we have Alfred Molina. And I don't, I don't remember if we... I uh, discussed this on the show for October Sky, but the guy who played Roy Lee was also in Identity. He played the he was, yeah. scary boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And so I almost feel, I uh, probably not, but I almost feel like just for the gag, next time I should choose something inside this universe because it just naturally happens anyway. Sure. No, so we're creating our own cinematic universe yeah. here. So the, the next movie's got to have like Jay Baruchel. Building worlds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That'd be great, um, but yeah, it was uh, it was it was it was a great it was a fantastic watch. It's such a bad movie, but it's a great watch. So, it's so bad. all right, so I don't need to know your history then with it because your history yeah. with it was none. It's we just watched it. Um, how familiar with you with this movie were you prior to this? Like, had you heard of it? Did you kind of know I much about it? My exact reaction was. Oh yeah, they made a live action Sorcerer's Apprentice. That sounds great. <laughs> so that's my, that's my absolute history with it. And honestly, I think this is my third Nick Cage movie. Oh wow! The other two being City of Angels and National Treasure, which is quite a spread in a narrow time. It I is. Feel. It is. Um, so I remember marketing for this movie, uh, mm-hmm. but I did not see it. Um, I actually made no connection that it was. Uh, even even knowing it was Disney, I didn't make the connection to Fantasia at all. Like it just didn't dawn right. on me. I'm like, oh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Just you know, it's a it's a clever name. It's mm-hmm. he's a sorcerer. He has an apprentice. It just didn't it didn't really register. And then uh-huh. there's a scene we'll talk about later that I was like, oh, oh, okay, no, this that is what they're doing here uh, a little bit. And it was kind of clever, but then. I, I take a little bit of issue with that. We'll get there. But but outside of like it being a Nicolas Cage movie and seeing some marketing for it, I really didn't know much about it other than it was a huge flop. This movie came out July 14th, right. 2010. On a yeah, when I saw that it came out in the summer after seeing it, I was like, oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, and it, it had a $150 million dollar budget estimated. Oh, geez. So Yeah, not, the effects were actually really good. Which and we are going to talk about. St- Still hold up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, There's we're going to, like, we're going like, to dive like into Like we those. said, lots of notes, lots mm-hmm. of notes. 
Uh, but a hundred and fifty million dollar budget, that's not including marketing, which you have to figure is anywhere from fifty to a hundred million dollars probably itself, because they marketed it pretty heavy. Sure. Um it made in the US sixty three million. It made two fifteen worldwide. So mm-hmm. it was a bomb box office wise. And it had the problem of the week before this came out was Mm -hmm. uh, the week that Inception and Despicable Me came out. Oh, no. So you had Inception. Like Lance going to the slaughter. Right. You know know what it is? It's it's UHF all over again. And that UHF came out like the same summer as Batman. So there was no way anyone was going to see anything but Batman. This was like all the adults are going to Inception, Mm -hmm. right? And all the kids want to go see Despicable Me. And that's got all the word of mouth by week two. So no... None, and this is very firmly a movie targeted at a young adult audience. Oh, it is Disney AF, like, and it is them. They are trying from to the start oh, from oh, the start. Absolutely, they're they're riding on the coattails of mm-hmm. Warner Brothers and the whole Harry Potter trend. And you got your Twilights, and you've got. Um, Every Harry Potter effect. It's so impressive. It's like Jerry Bruckheimer wanted to make a movie that was a cross between like Harry Potter and I could, I, I, I think I said Spy Kids earlier, but like, yeah, like because I mean, like it just has different, so many different components of so many different movies and so many homages, which we have to get to later. But I was screaming at my TV <laughs> at one point. Um, I was like, they did not just do that because it, like, by the end of it, if you have any doubts that they, they were so aware of the crimes that they were committing with this movie and they did not care so and if you have any doubts of that you will not by the end of this movie they it's, completely lean into it and run into it face first oh yeah and it's it's, it's very much like so disney in uh the early 2000s they had pirates of the caribbean right and that was mm-hmm. a runaway success yeah. and Nobody really expected much out of that. I remember when I first saw that they were making a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, my, my reaction was, huh? And then I went and saw mm-hmm. it and I loved it because it had, it had a genuine heart to it. There was mm-hmm. a lot of uh, just earnestness in that as well as great performances and a fun story, this great adventure story that they wrote. And Disney was t- really trying to recapture that magic in the mid mm-hmm. late 2000s and into 2010. Oh, they were desperate for it because they were, they were coming off that whole that whole um thing when they started getting restrictions on their movies. Yeah. And so like their revenue was super down. Mm-hmm. Um I mean they still had blockbusters like, you know, Finding Nemo, what Toy Story uh 2, 3, what have you. But like when when they got smacked with that antitrust stuff, in the nineties that rocked their world hard. And so they were like grasping at straws for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, when you have a movie that does as well as pirates does and spawns a franchise. And by this point they had, I think three of the movies out. um, Mm -hmm. You try to recapture that. You try to do more of that. Right. So they were trying things like um, this would have been around the era, I believe of um, like John Carter, of Mars was in this okay. same era. Um, they were trying, I think the next year was Tomorrowland. I think it was 2011 or around Tomorrowland, that same time. I've, I've seen some of Tomorrowland and it, if I've always thought like if, if film sack ever does a dumb Disney movie, Tomorrowland would be a good candidate. Um, this movie would be like, it's, 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 it's way too, way too on the nose, but anyway, continue. Well, maybe, but uh, there's definitely some sackability. Oh, that's fun, yeah. Um, oh, but, for sure. But like, uh, they also had um, Nick Cage a few years before this, and in, in 2004 and then 2007, does the National Treasure films, National Treasure right. and Book of Secrets, with this same director, mm-hmm. John Turtletop. So mm-hmm. they'd worked together before. Nick Cage actually had the idea for this movie. It was his idea of like, I want to play a, I want to play a wizard or a sorcerer in a movie and do something kind of modern setting with magic. So I want to be, I want to be something weird. Yeah, basically. (laughs) 
And, I wish I could do a Nick Cage impression. You know, I've, I've talked about this for the last couple of weeks. Um, and it's part of why I celebrate him every year because he makes decisions and he does things yes, he because does. he wants to he do does. them. He owns every damn thing he does. And it's insane. It, and it is like, and it doesn't always work. This movie, no. for me, I'm just going to say this was like a, um, and it sort of falls in line with the IMDb score. Now, part of the reason that it bombed so much at the box office, critics. Critics did not take kindly to this. I think it's oh, Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Critics rating is somewhere in the 40s. So not great. Audience yeah. scores like 50 something. IMDb's got it around a six, just above a six out of 10, which is kind of where yeah. I would put it. Because here's the thing. I had fun. Uh -huh. I had a fun yeah, time Yeah, oh, it this. is a blast. And he is so perfect like it's like it is it was built around him mm -hmm. for sure for sure and like he does so much to pull it together and it, he is so effing weird <laughs> and like his entrance is incredible it's just it's oh yeah like low-key iconic he just comes in and just starts saying well you know the history of this this face or whatever blah blah and it's just like in the way, oh God, there's so much to talk about that we'll get to, but well, it's just, it fits, it fits so well because it's built around him and it's just done the right way mm -hmm. for him. Having said that, Alfred Molina, while good, I don't think there's as much cohesion with him, This, if, if that makes sense. Like I can, he's really good for the role. He does his part really well. But I, saying someone is is like perfect for something, it feels like the movie kind of pulls in a little more because of them. And I don't necessarily feel that for 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 him. Do you get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Like, I would I would disagree. But it's because it's not built around him. That, that's true. That that is right. true. Yeah, it's not the, his fault. It's, the it's movie bad. has the problem of it wants to be young adult and accessible, right? So it wants to be mm -hmm. uh, fairly family friendly oh, yeah. and broad audience, but it has a few moments that it goes a little bit darker, um, but it doesn't lean and into they could that. they could have done so much with that and that would have been oh, yeah. so good. And, there, and it, also, yeah, it, it also has the problem of overstuffing itself because the plot, it, the plot oh, sure. is very simple. Yeah. But they added in the romantic angle that does feel very tacked on. I get oh why God. it's there. I understand yeah, that, but, but it, it didn't. So hand well, it's just, it's not executed well. And I think, like, I think that the first act, the first third of the movie, mm -hmm. incredibly strong. I think everything leading up to um, and including the scene in Chinatown in New York is great because we get the introduction. That was, cool. that was great. Yeah. We, well, we get the introduction of Balthazar. We get the introduction of Horvath. We get Dave. Now, half of the time he's a kid, and I think it actually worked better in some part, in some ways, with him at 10 years old than with him at 20. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one, one thing is they probably should have aged him down a little bit if you're going for that young adult type area. Um, mm -hmm. But... Up until and and the whole plot at that stage is them the these two sets of wizards going after an item. They're going after this nesting right. doll. Mm -hmm. But then they get the nesting doll a third of the way into the movie. And all of mm -hmm. a sudden we no longer have this driving plot force of the MacGuffin and going after that. Now it's a third right, of the Cage movie. Even, and Cage even says, Okay, we're done, go home, bye. We're right. done. I'm, yeah. a man of, I'm, 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 a, I'm a man of my word or whatever he says. I always fear into Jimmy Stewart. Sorry. <laughs> but, it's easy to do. It's easy to do. Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart's I'm, a, a good one. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one of those things where <laughs> we, we get to that point, they get the MacGuffin and then everything grinds to a halt. And now we have the sorcerer training stuff and the, him trying to woo mm -hmm. the girl stuff and all this stuff that should have been yeah. part one that mm -hmm. should have been act one. And yeah. now we have it there. And it, so the pacing's a little bit off, which is a bummer, right? Because yeah, 
it's it's one of those things, and I know I say this all the time, but Lord of the Rings is one of the best book to screen adaptations because uh, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens realized and found what was going to make their movie work in the story of the Lord of the Rings. And they based mm -hmm. things around that. So any alterations they made to the books right. were to serve that story. They were always doing it with the, with the mind of what right. is moving our story forward. And I feel Which like, is like why they don't have Tom Bombadil, like as exactly. central as he is mm -hmm. it, like but that, that would add too much to the story and there would be too much support. And suddenly you have two or three films naturally, like they had to do with the yeah. Hobbit. But well, like they chose to do with Hobbit because money, but like, but we're, but we're talking like about you, a, yeah. And, and we're talking about a movie here in the Sorcerer's Apprentice with five it's a, credited like a seven minute piece. It's a seven minute piece of music that caused a cartoon in, in Fantasia that they said, Hey, that could, Hey, that's, Hey, that's, that has some wizards in it. <laughs> let's, right. let's put an age in that. But it's like, five credited screenwriters for this is too many people involved it's in like writing a Jennifer this. Lopez song. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and I do think that's where you get your problems, right? You've got five like people Jennifer. plus who else were, you know, uncredited mm -hmm. working on this script and mm -hmm. Bruckheimer who Jerry Bruckheimer is always going to be heavily involved. In fact, um, of course the movie a couple weeks ago, gone in 60 seconds was a Bruckheimer production. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things that JF and I talked about on that episode. If you go back a couple of episodes is Bruckheimer putting his Bruckheimer stamp on things. You can tell when it's mm -hmm. a Bruckheimer movie and sometimes oh, yeah, it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got that added in and you've got cage added onto that. And so it felt like things just didn't go in the order that they should have to keep the flow going. Like right. there's, there's things you could have done. For instance, Balthazar. Awesome. Dave, oh, he's yeah. our main character. Great. Mm -hmm. Horvath, great villain. Right? Amazing, yeah. Great. Drake. Yeah. Terrible. Drake. Yeah. Drake didn't need to be there at all. Drake Drake I... needed Drake the, the thing with Drake is he was there to be mm -hmm. the antithesis of Dave, but then he's mm -hmm. just he's just summarily like brushed off for yeah. you know horvath takes his power and that's it and then we get no other wizards that do anything all these wizards that were trapped inside the nesting doll and he's just like letting them out and taking their power and moving on and mm -hmm. that was the bummer like drake could have been really interesting could have been a oh, fun yeah. character to have yeah i think tony kebble especially is, in that guy's hands. toby toby kebble um is great but he wasn't given a whole lot yeah. to work with here so it became a very very much caricature although Although there were a couple of jokes involving him that did make me laugh. Um, yeah. The the main one was in the bathroom when he comes oh, in yep. and he finds, yeah. he finds Dave in there and he's talking to him and Dave has no idea who he is whatsoever. He's like, wait, you don't recognize me? And he asks him if he was in Depeche mode. That one That's down. such a good line. That's a banger. Especially in 2010. That's such a deep cut. That's great. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I do feel like maybe they were like five minutes away from casting Russell Brand. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, I, that's, I that's mean, very much like, the fear. Not, not that they would have, because obviously mm -hmm. they didn't thank God, but like, it's that, it's, it's that arena, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's that it's, type of character. It's saucy, saucy, crusty, rock and roll, um, uh, English guy. I almost felt that this could have been like Hugh Grant, if you gave him some MDMA or something <laughs> like, uh, but like, you know, you, you have the snakeskin boots, you have the, 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 the crazy wash jeans, you have the, the loud jacket, the Duran Duran clothes, you have, it, it, he's everything. All he and all at once like, too. It's like, yeah, he looks like an extra from a Genesis video, like an <laughs> early Genesis video, but like, um, he's, he's just kind of wasted as a, as a just, character. Just, yeah. yeah. They either yeah, needed, they, they role, either needed less of him. His job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They needed either less of him or more of him. Right. But they, they fell in the middle. It's sort of like, um, uh, Dave's roommate, Bennett. Yeah, man, I loved him. He, he was there for he, he, 
one scene and then we just forget about right. him for 90 percent of the movie for him to just show mm-hmm. back up out of nowhere for no reason other than yeah and like, then dude is about to have you know a fantastic night and he he gets interrupted mm-hmm. and like you know that's that's <laughs> That's no way to treat a guy. A right? Severe case of coitus interruptus. And like, like, like. Also, I also, I also kept seeing like Forrest Whitaker in his face. Um, yeah, there's a little maybe, bit of that. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's not who I'm thinking of. But he, yeah, he, he, he captures somebody else's like young essence. But he was great. I, he was I fun. Him. I, yeah, I wish, I wish there was so much more of him. And like the way he reacted to the thing kept it so like above the, like above the WB line that you were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. And like, he just, not to say that he elevated it because I mean, if you, if nobody's going to elevate higher than Nick Cage, because that's, no. you know, again, when it's built around him, you know, it's all, it's all built in, but like, um, he was just he was so great, especially for like that sort of like throwaway role. Yeah. And it, so, okay. If I'm making this movie, one of the things that I need to figure out early on in the writing process is, are we going to have a love interest or not? And how are we going to do that? Because to have, having her there, the the problem is that her character serves nothing other than um, a uh, motivation for Dave. She doesn't really have anything of her her own to do, which is a bummer. And mm-hmm. on top of that, it 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 takes away from things like Dave and his roommate. It takes away from mm-hmm. Dave versus Drake. Yeah. And and she's really only there for the very end to do two things: to be caught. And the the reason that Dave gives up his ring and the nesting doll, right. and then yeah. to help him by somehow having the lower body strength to kick that satellite dish out of alignment, uh, like she did, which was, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, probably the most impressive physical thing anyone did in the movie was kick that satellite dish, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it it's unfortunate because it could have been again. Really well done. This movie is an hour 40, hour 45, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not too short, but it's not too long either. And yet it still felt like stuff just didn't come together. It just, it's kind of like, it's kind of like they took, okay, so you know how writers use plot cards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like they, it's like they, they did the whole plot card exercise and came up with their, their stack and then threw it up in the air. And when it landed, they said, let's do that. Like, because yeah. everything, everything is offset. Nothing. There's, there's so little cohesion. I know I mentioned cohesion earlier. What cohesion? And that's part of the problem is yeah. like, as fun, this movie, I just watched it like twice in a row. It is so fun. It is so fun. It but is, like, and it looks and, and like so the, good. Yeah, and it's so there's so much effort, but there is just not enough cohesive effort. You know, this is not Breaking Bad. This is not something that is just like the tightest thing you will ever see on any screen. Well, this is very much the opposite of that, and it's ju- it just seems like it's in like you were saying earlier. It seems like it was in too many hands. It, it, it see like it does. It, it, there it, are. There are breaks in the dialogue that it's like somebody else wrote that. Like oh, the yeah. way they drop into scientific stuff is almost like somebody pulled up a Wikipedia page, like and is reading from that. And yes, and there so, are other and there are other parts of dialogue, especially Nick Cage, that just it sound it sounds like he just read it off something in his back pocket. I have I have thoughts on some of that. Um because I agree with you there. They're like, again, cool ideas without great execution. But this is a director, John Turtletop. Who, John Turtletop is solid. Like, it, here's some of the movies that he made prior to this. Okay, so this comes out in 2010. So prior to this, he had made the the first three ninjas, which, say what you want, that's a fun movie. Um, sure. Cool Runnings was a John Turtletop movie. Phenomenal. So I was... 
it's head on when I said when when I said that it that it seemed like this was a, a like a little bit Spy Kids. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Um, phenomenon. Um, yes. Instinct. The Kid with Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. Disney's The Kid, mm -hmm. and then National Treasure and National Treasure Book of Secrets right. were his mm -hmm. uh, movies, his films leading up to this one. So, like, he was capable of because National Treasure is this movie so this staff, type of movie so, so 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 he's like a staff guy at disney basically kind of i mean like, he's he's one of them that they would go to disney for a lot of this yeah yeah but he's capable of making fun enjoyable kind of family friendly romps like, sure. like national treasure is butter. what this movie is striving to be right national treasure is Absolutely. uh is a very tight very focused thing because it's like they 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 set you up with an idea that idea is in the first one we're going to steal the declaration of independence and then that's their goal the whole time but i feel like here when you you mentioned it earlier with like just too many too many uh hands in the pot they had an idea which is morgan Le Fay and that nesting doll and that's your macguffin but everything got out of order that needed to be the 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 strive for that needed to be act two. Act one needed to be Balthazar finding Dave, teaching him. Then Horvath gets yeah, released. Then we go after the urn and we can use that to drive things forward. Because what we got was we got act one and then everything grinds to a halt for act two, which then we kind of replay big parts of act one leading up to our climax in, you in know, act three. Like... Lord of the Rings does that in Act Two, doesn't it? With um, Gandalf and Sauron, like in the first movie. Um, but that's one scene, right? Whereas like, there's this was so like much half an hour of the movie, right? I mention it because at some point I think of it, like when he's when he's throwing Melina up on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. It like it's not it doesn't point to it at all, but like I recently saw it. Like we recently saw um, Return of the King, so so there's there's all that, um, and that was <clears throat> sorry on my mind. So so obviously I saw it, and it's like you they're wanting to put. It seems like they're wanting to stretch the quality of that sort of scene out, and like it's it's just it they went too thin maybe you could get 15 20 minutes out of it but not as as hard as they went and when i watched it today to your point i was like why are they why are they doing this now like that yeah it, again i mean he should talk about what is interrupt us it's it's the 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 plot point of putting both balthazar and horvath inside of that urn at the same time and having them then get released at the same time that was cool but also it it hurts the movie because it's what we so need is we need balthazar to be teaching dave and go through all of that stuff in the first half hour that way we learn we know who balthazar is we know who dave is we know their motivations and we yeah. care about and then them you get then you get entangled yes then the plot kicks in then we go after that urn now we can have those things going on, but they just got those out of order, which is a bummer because those set pieces, like all the set pieces in this are great. And this movie looks so good because mm -hmm. they did a lot of practical on set effects that then they extended. Right. So I was watching some behind the scenes stuff and like the fight inside of, by the way, Arcana Cabana is a fantastic name for a story. Arcan. Arcan. What? I, I yes, want yes, it I is. want it's, magic and curiosities and oddity store called Arcana. That would, that would be that would be that would um, be fantastic. Although it did keep making me think of Barry Manilow, <laughs> which is distressing to say the it's, least. It's something. Um, yeah, it is. but it was one of those. Uh, what well, I was watching. What <laughs> I was watching behind the scenes stuff, and a lot of that, like when Horvath is throwing fire around, they had mm -hmm. uh, you know like fireproof oh, so gloves cool. and gel. And they would light yeah. his hand on fire to be able to film real fire. And then they could use that okay. to extend in the, uh -huh. into the visual effects. So like 
there was a lot of practical onset stuff done at the time, which inflated the budget, but it looks so good. Everything yeah. looks cool about it. And the magic design too. There was a lot yeah. of magic in this. One of the things I remember, I, I remember watching, I can't remember which one it was, but it was one of the Harry Potter movies. And then mm -hmm. I talked to a friend of mine about it and his complaint was they didn't do enough magic. He wanted more like just throwing spells around kind of thing. Um, and this movie was not afraid to do that. Like they threw spells around, but they were, right. I loved the way the spells came about, like how um, mm -hmm. the dragon in the Chinatown scene is the that dragon so on cool. the street and then it that... morphs. Yeah. Was awesome. And like the people that are inside of it become part of that dragon that's chasing after Dave. Mm -hmm. Uh, while and, it's and, also and, like, like the how tattoos he had it on the thing, yeah, mm -hmm. on on the thing on his stomach. That was so cool, and I was amazed that that didn't look hokey. No, and it easily like, could have. It looked, yeah, and it looked really good. Like really the, good. The big metal eagle that he gets off the building, off the Chrysler building. I think mm -hmm. it's the Chrysler building. Um, yeah. But, oh my god. And it was like it was a bird that he morphed into or he, he melded with that thing and then it's flying around or wh however that went. But like that could have looked really bad, but they did such a good job to make granted. It helps that everything they shot with that bird was at night, uh -huh. but it looked good. The wolves looked good. Although I did read <laughs> they used real wolves for that scene. Yes. Yes, they did. I found that out as well. I was like, you know, this looks so much better than the second Twilight movie, where which was out at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they used all these fake wolves because, hello, it's part of the story. And I was like, that looks so much better. And my partner, Amanda, was like, they used real ones. I said, what? But like, I did uh, I did read they had to do a little touch up work to the faces in mm -hmm. post production mm -hmm. to make them look more aggressive because the wolves were uh very tamed and so they were very they friendly a thing going on and they were always like happy and wagging their tails yeah so i thought that was that was clever but like i just loved that kind of stuff right like the 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 throwing of the plasma bolts and the fire throwing and like all of the plasma magic -y magic so stuff cool. that they were like, doing like like very dragon ball z mm -hmm. but still like impressive to see to see live now i'll i'll, I'll say the one where he's trying to get where he's trying to get control of it. That is the most Disney thing in the whole freaking movie. Yeah. That was, that was both just kind of like a little eye rolling, but it was just so well done at the same time. They just nailed it. But even stuff like, it, like the, the, the circles was really cool. on the yeah. floor. That. Which I, in his, in his super convenient looked, secret layer that he had. Uh, uh, which I that is, like, I had a note where I'm like, what professor would have access to a subway transfer turnaround and would just give it to this kid? Okay. But then later on, his off the books secret lab is just in his. Yeah, I was like, record. what are we like, what in Lex Luthor's lair? What is great. going on here? That it was so crazy. like, uh, just great. the plot convenience of him having that. But, but like, yeah. all oh, that stuff looks so insane. good. And yeah, again, just dress so well. Yeah. Same same thing, practical on set stuff that they could extend, right? So like the circles of fire and everything, they had yeah. circles of fire that they could stand that inside was, of. They had flames for all of that. That was such an exciting effect. Mm -hmm. It and looked like even looking amazing. close at it, like on my rewatch, I watched it in my lap on a screen and I looked so closely and it looked so good. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as real as that's going to look. Um, and, and it doesn't just like hold up for 2010. It just holds up. It yeah. just looks really neat. I mean, there's, there's a couple of times where some of the CG maybe looks a little hokey, but it, n there's no amount of visual effects that aren't going to age at some point. Right. Just, yeah. Yeah. Like s some of the particle effects, obviously, because, you know, things were a little more even -y than an algorithmic -y, and now yeah. everything is is different now and it looks better. And so we can tell for that, by the way, all of that confetti was real. I found mm -hmm. out. I did find that like, out. That was crazy. I, I, like, a, like 1400 pounds of it or something. I um, can't imagine the cleanup like that. for that alone like, must've been. No. Um, but, 
Um, but yeah, it just, it just, everything looked awesome. The costuming was great. Like Al, uh, Alfred Molina is Horvath. Oh, oh yeah. His, his costuming was great. His was great. Uh, you know, Cage looked awesome. I, it's, it's one of the better hair he pieces looked- he's worn. Uh huh. I thought that over and over again. <laughs> Cause it looked good. It fit him. Um, cause I think it was the year after this, he did, uh, season of the witch, which in, the- and in I that he had long hair as well. And it didn't look as good. Um, no. and, and we won't even go into things like drive angry where the hair was terrible. Um, but like that coat he had was cool. It's just, it was a cool look for a sorcerer because he didn't have the traditional like robes and big beard. Mm-hmm. And I like, he looks magical look. without looking like a wizard. He, yes. You know what it gave me was, uh, not exactly, but it gave me like Harry Dresden vibes. Like I could yeah. see a version of Harry Dresden wearing something like that, right? With like the long coat, kind of a duster mm-hmm. thing. It's just the feeling that I got, whether or not it's even close to that, I don't know, but that was just how it felt to me. But I love, and I love the magic use in current setting. That's always mm-hmm. been fascinating to me. Um, it was funny how they have the line of, we can't let normal people see the magic because it would be complicated, but then they're not subtle in any way throughout the rest of the movie about yeah, using magic just, at all. Um, by the way, the car. Yes. That Rolls Royce. Yeah. So that was a 1935 Rolls Royce Phantom. That thing was mm-hmm. awesome. You know what the cool, coolest part about that is? It that was Nick Cage's car. Man himself. That's right. <laughs> and and like when he gets in and he's like, she missed me. Like it oh. just like he it's so it's it's just it it's right in the pocket. That's the it's stuff great. That is where like that and the action set pieces and this kind of stuff, that's where the movie was at its strongest, and they needed to lean into that. Even the there's the scene in the bathroom when Drake goes in. It's silly Mm -hmm. because like Drake goes into the bathroom, but then Horvath comes in right after him. And then Balthazar comes in right after him. Mm -hmm. So nobody in this school cares whatsoever about all this stuff going on in this public bathroom. But that was a fun scene and it had a great ending to it with the mirror gag. Yeah. Um, Which also did make me laugh when when the guy passes out in front of him. Yeah, Um, he's just like, "Eh." oh, there was another, what was the other joke? I wrote it down that made me laugh out loud. Uh, like legitimately got me. With oh, I jokes. laughed so many times in this movie. Not always when I'm supposed to. Um, but also like, let's see, I don't, I don't have anything for in the past. Anymore. It was also formulaic was a, was a big thing, right? Like it oh, was very Christ tropey God. by the Gosh, book. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, it is. And like the whole movie, I was like, okay, so this guy's doing this thing. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. this and this is that role. Okay. And oh, they're doing this thing. That's nice, nice. And like the which which I mean made the romantic the romantic um the romantic line stand out more because that tried to be cookie cutter. And it, it the thing that really drives me crazy is I feel it could have been better. Oh, could have very much so, been better. with so little effort. But no, like, see, hold on. There's, there's some, some line in here. Um, I, the love story makes it almost makes me angry. There's just no point in it at all, it's, and there's no, there's no attempt at integrating it into the story. No, really, there really, like, really is. It is on paper, but that's it. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no circuitry. There's no support. There is. It's absolutely baseless. Yeah, I mean. Um, Again, I know what they're going for. I understand Absolutely. why they're putting it in there, but they got to do a better job of it because yeah. like, for instance, and I, I, this might be beating the dead horse, but go back a couple of years oh, yeah. to um, National Treasure, right? Uh-huh. Because, and it's a good comparison because it's the same director and it's uh, same director, producer, and star, right? It's Cage, it's Bruckheimer, it's Turtle Top. They worked in a romantic angle there that fit the plot because Ben Gates meets the the woman um, at and you know has a thing for her, but then she is interested in the history of it, and through their adventure is how they meet and how they get together. Whereas this was like 
he had this one moment. He was he had a crush on this girl at ten. I think I actually had a couple of notes. The the mummy is like that as well. Yes. Yes. The mummy is a good example of that. But but like I had in here in a couple of my notes was like, you know, man, hormones will do some weird things to you when you're when you're young, when you're young. Uh they will they will get you to do some dumb stuff. And uh that was the case here with Dave. Like Mm -hmm. but and and I found the line, by the way, that legitimately made me laugh out loud (laughs) was right after the whole thing with the dragon uh, or during that. And he, he's like, clear my mind. Are you insane? And it was that moment of, are you insane? And cage just given the, like the little symbol yeah. with the dong. Yeah. And he's like, eh, yeah. okay, I captured that. Uh, I'll play it in a little bit, but it, that legitimately made me laugh out loud. Um, it was really, like good. I said, they knew, they knew what they were doing and they had no, they gave, no shits about it like they did well, not it's care just, uh, the frustrating thing about it is unbridled audacity there was so <laughs> many cool ideas in this i love the right. ideas of magic users and sorcerers and everything in a modern world i love the mm-hmm. idea of of magic and science being two sides of the same coin and them toying Absolutely. with that for a minute mm-hmm. now they did fall into the tropey uh, misconception of the ten percent of your brain. Although, oh my god! Although I, that, I said, oh, I said here we go. I, I rolled at that. But if you listen to the line of dialogue, it is cleverly written in that he doesn't say people only use ten percent of their brain. What he says is, "Have you ever heard that?" Well, magic is basically because magic helps you use your whole brain. Yeah, and so like again, it's I give that a little bit of a pass because. It's a shorthand thing, but it's just it's just dumb. We we use all of our brain. We just use it in different ways at different times. But I loved the idea of science and magic, and that's why like Dave having this innate ability uh, from his bloodline of Merlin, um, however mm-hmm. tenuous that is, helped him to understand physics much better. Mm-hmm. And he used that in a in conjunction with the magic to beat. Morgan at the end, I loved that idea. They didn't dive enough into it. They didn't give us enough right. of that because we spent too much time um, with the love interest, but also like Horvath and Drake spend a good portion of this movie just kind of not doing anything. And the only reason, the only reason they're able to find Balthazar and Dave is because Dave's unregistered, unlicensed, like, uh, you know, unregistered lab is in his record at the school because yeah. it is what? like, that didn't make any sense at all at all. So that's, that's like so many things feel like people grabbing at plot elements mm-hmm. and it's just like, that was uh, the, we need a reason. We need some way for them to find them. Oh, well this will work. And it did have probably mm-hmm. my biggest groan inducing joke in it, which was clever but also like, ay. um, and this is pre Disney owning star Wars. Um, yeah. But, oh, <laughs> tell it. And then I have a story about it, but the whole, uh, <laughs> waving my Jedi mind trick thing, uh, mm-hmm. was, you know, it was, it was cute, but when, it also like made me groan at the same time. It was like when my partners, joke. when my partner saw it, she said, these are not the, the droids you are looking for. And then they said it. And it's like, oh, my God. Yep. They went there. Like I said, if you have any doubts that they just are going headlong into all of this BS, <laughs> like they make it. First of all, they knew you would question. Mm-hmm. I guarantee and oh, yeah. they were like, you know what? We have to put some breadcrumbs in for these good people who come to see our movie. They mm-hmm. can't. They can't question our intentions like this. And um, and my God, they delivered <laughs> the, um, the, the the scene real quick. The scene that made me want to die. Yeah. The the whole freaking scene is the thunder is when he's talking about thunder and lightning and <laughs> you know at the subway thing that whole thing felt like a zach and cody episode that whole like, thing that, felt like that, a that so yeah bad. That, that they have whole, no chemistry they have no chemistry together it they 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 it, no. it, 
they no, they, they vibed together like friends. It was more like it was more like bridge to Terabithia or something. Like it was it was it was very it was weird. It was weird. And that scene so, served very little purpose in anything plot related other than to set up right. another date, which they could have done without ever going to the subway station. Yeah. And we didn't need him going off to fight Curtis from the Punisher, which is all <laughs> like, I saw him. I'm like, Hey, I know that guy. Um, but which one? The, the mugger, the guy no, that tries no, to no, mug no. Him. Oh, no, from which, the, yeah. from the defenders series, the John Bernthal oh, okay. Punisher. Oh, cool. Cool. Um, but like that whole scene in the subway just makes no sense and doesn't need to be there. And that's one of those things where <sighs> trim that out. We don't need that. Yeah. We can put that runtime towards some more plot development and some more character work that actually mm -hmm. matters to our story. What story are you trying to tell? Is this right. story about stopping about, uh, about Balthazar and stopping Morgan Le Fay while teaching Dave, or is it about Dave finding his the love of his life like they they just they needed to balance that they couldn't they needed to figure out which one of those they were doing because yeah not to there's no, just some cool sorry, stuff ahead. that they just they, oh, they just didn't get there and it was it, it annoyed mm -hmm. me and that's a bummer because like jay baruchel uh i like him a lot um his and I... he does that awkwardly charming thing really well now i do wonder because this is the same year uh -huh. that how to train your dragon came out Right. And prior to that, he was kind of a little bit more known for sort of your uh, like stoner comedies and things like Fanboys, oh, yeah. Tropic mm -hmm. Thunder, uh, Knocked Up he was in, like that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and then mm -hmm. he does How to Train Your Dragon. Oh, She's Out of My League was another one of his. Um, actually, mm -hmm. same year. Mm -hmm. 2010, he, does, uh, he has She's Out of My League come out, How to Train Your Dragon, and The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, I wonder if this movie had come out like a year after how to train your dragon, if it makes any difference in the marketing for it, because he's oh, more known probably. for that at that point than he is for these kind of more raunchy comedies. Probably because I mean, like it's how to train your dragon. This movie has dragons like they're Disney. They can figure that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but like, yeah, I, thought he was, I, I thought he was good. Even though he's I thought in the role twenty. It, yeah, in the role, I I still haven't seen How to Train Your Dragon, mm. and so I'm not used to his to his his voice. Okay, and to me, he felt like a cross between um, Rick Moranis, but not as sad or Canadian. Definitely a, like a like a Jersey Rick Moranis, <laughs> and. Um. What well, what was the other guy from um from SCTV? Like um, oh Rick Moranis crossed with Martin Short and a little bit of French Stewart, but not French Stewart. Jimmy Fallon's impression yes. of French Stewart because that's what I kept hearing every time he said something. Yeah, and it I mean, kind of made me sad for him. But he was really good at the role. Yeah, he. I think he does awkwardly charming well. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he was a good fit for this movie. I just wonder if at the time, again, like you set this, you, you have this come out a year or two later and you can kind of, oh, you've got, sure. you know, he's hiccup at that point. And yeah. so the younger audience is going to recognize the voice at mm -hmm. least and kind of go for that. Um, mm -hmm. I think too, there was like, there's just, there's certain things like Horvath, for instance, Horvath was a, a fun character. And he even had some moments that were real dark that I wasn't ready for. Because when he comes out of the urn and mm -hmm. drops the urn off the thing and he leaves, right? And he goes outside and he's standing in the street outside of the old Arcana Cabana and kind of mm -hmm. replaying things that go on. And that car drives up and is like yelling at him, the, the whole New York thing, yelling at him to go. And he just straight mm -hmm. up throws knives into that dude and kills him. That, mm -hmm. I was, I wasn't. Like at that, up to that point in the movie, it wasn't that kind of movie. And then they did that and he's, yeah. I'm like, oh, so, so there's where if they, they either needed to fully sanitize this or, or they needed to lean a little more into the PG 13 angle of it mm -hmm. and aim it instead of at 
say your 10 to 13 year olds, which is kind of where this was supposed I feel like this was mm-hmm. being aimed at. Aim it at Also, your this is pre this is pre Avengers, so that would be that would be with the right stuff. That would be an easy get at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're not you know, we had we didn't even have Captain America yet, I don't think. Um No. Um no, he would have been We had we had Iron Man and there was tons of buzz about that. Maybe we had we had Captain America this this I think he was summer, the same year. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. Um but um like it, it 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 probably wouldn't have been that difficult a task if they had figured out which audience that they were trying to do. Yeah. It tried to but, be a little too broad is what ended up happening. Right. It was it was trying to cover too many bases and because of that it didn't it didn't quite hit them. And it's a bummer. Right, because because they were like, we well, hey, we can be Disney, but we can also be these other people, and mm-hmm. we can be those people at the same time. And no, you, that's not how that how that works. I think they have since figured this out, but there was Much better, there was anyway. yeah, there was there was like a string of of movies where that where that happened, where it, it, they just kind of lost the thread for a little bit. A little. Also, yeah, part little. of it too is Horvath is your villain, right? Alfred Molina, he's mm-hmm. great. Super fun, but right. there's the whole time looming over of Morgana, and there's the whole yeah. thing of Veronica, and you get Alice Krieg and um, Monica Bellucci to play those parts, mm-hmm. and they're basically in the movie for five minutes at the end. Yeah, and like most of Morgana's stuff is like off screen, mm-hmm. which and can work, right? But the but form here, that she takes when she's on screen is so abstract and a little bit weird that right. it does it just didn't land. Plus, I'm not a big fan. I've said a lot. I like simplified plots, make your characters more uh more mm-hmm. um complex. Yeah. They reduced Horvath's whole motivation for everything that he did mm-hmm. to the jilted lover of he had a thing for Veronica. And mm-hmm. Veronica and Balthazar had their relationship and he was jealous. And so that's why he yeah. turned on Merlin and was doing everything that he did. That to me was super weak. Like that, I did not oh, like yeah. at all. That was, that was not great. Because there's a whole lot of dynamic and interesting stuff that you could tell with Bal- Balthazar and Horvath and Veronica mm-hmm. and... Merlin and Morgana and we get a little we get some exposition at the beginning huge exposition dump mm-hmm. narrated beautifully by Ian McShane I will say that oh that's um, who did that okay yeah oh yeah I recognize his voice right away mm-hmm. um but then Morgana is pretty much forgotten until the very end um which can work it just didn't hear mm-hmm. but Veronica is also basically forgotten until the very end and so yeah. When when she arrives, we don't really care because we've spent so much time with Dave and his girlfriend. We're like, oh, like when he when he makes her when Horvath is trying to lose Balthazar in a crowd, and he passes by this frumpy lady. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and taps her, and she becomes Veronica, and like. She passes by him. He, you know, Balthazar interacts, says, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were someone else. And she's like, Creep, get away from me. And walks away. <laughs> and, and like the first time I saw it, oh, I, I was like, Oh, that, huh? Oh, oh, it's her. Oh, okay. And again, and it's like such like, a wasted opportunity. Well, it is because there's a just, plot point a that a little bit more could have been so much better. Just a yeah, little bit because more. the idea of Balthazar caring about Veronica and understanding why Dave is uh, so into Becky is a plot point that is largely brushed over. And we get that moment. And then we get the moment later on when Dave has given the ring and the urn to Horvath and he's apologizing and Balthazar's like, I just, I'd have done the same thing. And that's it. That's all the development there. Really? That's where we're going to go. So many times they're like, wow, this is a, this is a, here's a, a, a scene. And you're like, wow, that's a really cool scene. And they're like, isn't it? 
Well, here's another one. Like, right. Yeah. They do just, something with it. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not like this can't be like the pastiche has to work together. Yes. And like there, the so many homages are heavy handed. Like the whole City of Angels thing was kind of insane and amazing. The thing, the thing that had me screaming. The thing that had me screaming was when Alfred Molina was across the room from Dave and Balthazar, and he says, "Give me the the thing, and I'll give you the girl." And I was like, "Holy God, they did yep. it!" Oh yeah, Holy well, and that's right crap. after we have we have Dave yeah. doing the whole Indiana Jones thing with the urn, like touching his face. Right, when, right. You know. It's like, man, like, hey. <laughs> Like, yeah, they, this they is really what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. Like, like, you know, this is not, not, not to the levels of amazingness, but this is kind of like nobody told Phil Collins that he had to go that hard for the Tarzan soundtrack. And this is kind of that order of magnitude, but with, we'll, we'll, hmm, we'll say <laughs> slightly um, less stellar results. But they're still really fun. Some of them were. Some of them were great. Like, yeah, I had a note down that some Drake of it Stone was like, "Really, come on." Yeah, like Drake, Drake Stone, for instance, I, I wrote down was a sanitized, uh, sanitized version of Chris Angel. Like that's what they were going for oh is that God, type right. of shock jock, um, mm -hmm. you know, street magician, but the disnified, mm -hmm. family friendly version of it. Is yeah. what Drake Stone was, um, but I loved right. Horvath. Like Horvath was not impressed with him at all, and their I, dynamic yeah, was, was a lot of fun. That I wish that we would mm -hmm. have had more of because he's just like you're an idiot, um, mm -hmm. and I dug that. And I just I there's so many little things that were potential uh, that didn't uh, just didn't pan out. I did though. I did find some. Uh, fair bit of audio that I captured that I, uh, I thought was kind of fun. I wish I had had more time. I just didn't have, excuse me, I just didn't have enough time the way things worked out this weekend, but I wish I had had more time to get clips because there were so <laughs> many good just zingers and clips, like not throughout the whole movie, but the ones that they, the ones that they landed, landed hard and oh, made yeah. an impression, just like everything else in this movie. Well, with five um, credited screenwriters, it's uh, going to be hit or miss. Somewhat, but yeah. When they land, they land. I did, right. though. So early on, during our, our opening narration, uh, we get this line from, uh, from the wonderful Ian McShane about Morgana. Until Morgana is destroyed by the prime millennium. And that, at that point, I paused and I was like, did I hear him right? Did he say this? And so I re-recorded. The prime millennium. The prime Merlinian. That made me laugh. Like na having all of your right. your sorcerers, your your good guy sorcerers are Merlinians. Uh, right. I don't right. know why that just it seems so dumb. And they, there's there's I, better ways they could. I thought have done about that, that too, and it's it's just it's just another thing that you're like, why 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 did we get this? in this movie like why why did this happen like the the way the way the way the way dave says um says tesla like it's a utah sports team <laughs> like what what even yeah and also the 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 song the song that it it plays when it first starts with the tesla coil superstition by the cd wonder or jeff mm -hmm. beck if you're a jeff beck fan um, like that was like the, that was the only song older than Jimmy Eat World in the whole flipping movie. Yeah. Why, why, why? And why was this guy like, I'm a guitar player. I know that song, but like a 20 year old in 2010, unless he's a music major, which he it literally establishes he is not like nobody how yeah i don't know what? i mean that was that come from? Back but, pocket. At same, 
Yeah, but at the same time, it's a great song, so I didn't really come Oh, yeah, fantastic. I was all. like, at the same time, I was like, oh, they chose that one because of like magic and superstition and Basically. all of that. It's like, just like they so, probably picked this song called Secrets that is like, you know, magic has secrets and all of that. Obviously, they played it for their, you know, their their romance story and their licensing. But, um, and, oh, when when the whole when the whole satellite array is lighting up, mm-hmm. when she's doing the whole pentagram thing, when it finally finally lights up, I I just elbowed my I I elbowed Amanda and I said, wouldn't it be funny if they started playing that song right now? And so. <laughs> When at the end of the movie, when they move to kiss and that song comes in right then, mm-hmm. I was like, holy crap, they did it. Oh, yeah. They came back you a knew third it. time. That, they, that needle yes. drop was coming. Yes. Like, like you said, they, they leaned into all of the tropes, like tropey McTroper face. They, mm-hmm. they painted the walls <laughs> with tropes. And the thing and, is, tropes. Tropes exist for a reason. They can work. Right. If they're done right. well, they work. Mm-hmm. Some of them in here were done okay. Mm-hmm. And Some quite a few of them were bit, just not. A bit a bit like gravel in the hubcap. Like you like you just yeah. like like I get this is kind of a natural, kind of a natural uh part of the process, but can we clean that up just just a little <laughs> just bit? A make little. it a little yeah, just just a just a but, um but but, I'm telling you though, when um, it when it landed, like it okay. landed hard. Bennett, was- roommate Bennett, oh. needed more screen time because he had he had this line. <laughs> I captured it. It was too good not to. Uh, and this is with him and Dave. She will remember me. She will remember me. Who are you, Braveheart? That's funny. That's good. I like that. That was so great. Um, also, the movie. You know, it, we've kind of mentioned it already, but it, like it was self aware enough in some of its dialogue to even poke fun at itself. When, when Dave goes up to the rooftop, which by the way, apparently getting to the rooftop of these skyscrapers is just like, yeah, whatever. But he goes up, he finds, he wanders the streets and finds, Mm -hmm. finds the actual coffee shop cafe where Becky is with her friends, right? Knew exactly where Uh to go. Then he leaves there. She follows him. So they go up to the rooftop and I did like Mm -hmm. this line from her was really good. Do you really think that one botch date was going to make me hate you forever? The, I and his yeah, reaction is like, well, well, yeah, I kind of did. Mm-hmm. Like that's that is actually fairly clever because it's such a trope in movies to have that one. You know, is, especially like romantic comedies, right? You have the the misconception, mm-hmm. the whatever type of sure. event, Error, yeah, comedy of errors thing, yeah. And and it and it does lead to somebody hating the other person or whatever it is. So I did like that they were self-aware enough to be like, did you really think that? Cause like, I liked that. I, I did that line to me felt like one of those, you know, like just drop dialogues that I was talking about earlier. Like it just didn't, it just didn't exactly fit. Maybe it felt a little too formal. I don't know. It didn't stand out the first time I watched it just st- stood out the second time. So maybe I'm a little cynical. I mean, I get that, but it, for me, that was one that worked better than some others. So I had to capture it. Um, I definitely see what you're (laughs) definitely see why you like it. I I also see what you're saying, but, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go on. It's fine. Um, but no, I had a couple, like Drake had a couple of good lines. Oh yeah, he did. Um, mm-hmm. first of all, he of course had to have because it was the hey, hey, re- the joke. Do you With get that the joke? Lazy English accent he had. Yep. But like you could have done the Jedi mind trick thing and would have been fine, but then to have him be like I don't need your faculty identification card. These are not the droids you're looking for. Like that's the huh? You get it? You get it? It's funny. Mm-hmm. It's funny because it's yeah. Star Wars. Waka waka waka. Yeah, yeah, that was a little bit much. But mm-hmm. his line earlier when he meets Horvath was really good because he talks about how his master that taught him just disappeared on him. And mm-hmm. we get left me with nothing but an incantus and some prescription grade abandonment issues. Oh, that was a good line. I like that. I may have to incorporate prescription grade and be- abandonment issues mm-hmm. into yeah. conversation somewhere because that was pretty good. Um, 
Oh, okay. The Cantonese, the, the, I have to say, um, the yeah. Cantonese scene where Horvath comes in, um, mm. or, or no, no, he he goes he goes to the, the Chinese tea room or whatever, which it's it's always Chinese tea rooms. It's never like the Polish deli, but like, um, and he. Um, he's speaking Cantonese and there's a whole exchange about that, but like that just randomly speaking Cantonese, I mean, not randomly, but randomly, um, it reminded me of Wayne's world, like the eats up in that whole thing. <laughs> kind of. Uh, yeah. That was another, by the way, uh, Marvel defenders saga actor. Um, oh, really? Wai Ching Ho, who played the, the old Chinese woman. She uh-huh. was in, uh, Iron Fist. And I think she showed up in Daredevil and then the Defenders um, as Madame Gao. So she was it's, a fairly important character in those. Funny. She looked familiar, although I've I've not seen one of those. She's probably been on an episode of The Mentalist or something. Probably. You know how that goes. But um, but um anyway, more clips. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you mentioned how some of the lines felt like they were kind of pushed in and uh-huh. um and forced in. There's one in particular. It stuck out to me because filmmaking 101 is assume your audience doesn't know anything and you have to really right. spoon feed everything mm-hmm. to them, which mm-hmm. can work in certain aspects of things. But sometimes you mm-hmm. have to, you have to treat your audience with some respect. And there was a particular one here and it stood out to me because I can hear where they added this line in, in post. The- ADR was so bad. There was so listen to this one. You'll you'll pick out where the ADR, which mm-hmm. which line I'm talking about in this. Where's the yeah. Grimhold? That doll you took from the shop. The doll held something very powerful. You can clearly hear that the line that doll you took from the shop was yeah. added in after the fact because it doesn't even sound like it was recorded in the same room because it wasn't. Right. Um, you didn't need that line. That line didn't need to be there. Yeah. That is, that one reeks of either a studio or a produ- like a studio exec or a producer or somebody being like, eh, you need something in there to, to explain where yeah, the, they what doll like he's talking about. The audience were idiots or something and, and yeah. figured out, hey, they, they need this extra thing. That's, that's what I've, I've heard it been referred to as, well, you know, Bob. And it's where mm-hmm. you just, where you, where you over explain everything. Yeah. And that bugged me just because I, I just, I noticed that stuff mm-hmm. and it's like, you don't need that. Audiences will figure it out. It just like, happens for five really, minutes, 10 minutes earlier in the movie. Right. Thanks for really thinking for me and, and, yeah. and giving me some, some encouragement and belief there. Thanks. Um, but then he can turn around and he can have great lines as well written for him. Like, did you ever see Morgana pull a rabbit out of a hat? I mean, come I like on. That one too. That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, he also made a really funny noise at one point. Like, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I just liked that. I just really liked that. Um, and I'm one that captures laughs. I love laughs. Uh-huh. Uh, I really love when they're obviously forced fake laughs, but I also just mm-hmm. love like awkward laughs or funny laughs or anything like that. And I got two. One is Dave and one is Drake. Mm-hmm. So this is Dave. <laughs> I don't know. I just like that. It's just <laughs> it was really good. Um, and then Drake uh, later on, <laughs> with just like the just the the letting out the breath laugh always gets me. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jay Baruchel, Dave had some good lines. Um, because I mentioned this one earlier, but of course I was going to capture it. Really, you don't recognize me? Are you in Depeche mode? Timely reference in 2010. Tell you what, uh, yeah. it was real good. Um, when he's talking to Bennett early on, and he mentions that he's going to be teaching math to the lit majors, and I just mm-hmm. loved teaching long division to English majors. I know it's like the Peace Corps, but it's 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 Heiderman's class. Hey, it's like the Peace Corps. <laughs> that there though, that felt like a conversation between two college kids. Like right, that was. That and there, there again, that's our act one. That was the strongest mm-hmm. act for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it even had 
this moment was too funny. It's it doesn't work as well in audio only format, but I still captured it anyway because it's just this one legitimately made me laugh out loud. It was so well delivered. Are you insane? A little bit. <laughs> so good. Cage had a couple of those moments with with his looks. The look he gives him. Yeah. He... I'll play I'll play the audio for it, but the look he gives uh Dave after uh he corrects him um later on mm -hmm. right after that scene was great he had so many great just moments of like he was looks. a force in this movie i mean oh, he was that's so nick cage but he was yeah this was great for him uh when they're when they do have the um subway scene it was again that whole scene was really silly and, and not really needed yeah. Yeah. but I did like this exchange. Here, here is where chemistry was actually pretty good between the two of them. Something about you seems different. I'm wearing new shoes. It's like the strain in his voice when he's saying it. Like, yeah, he's, he's got to think of something, and that's all he can come up with. Mm -hmm. Is I'm wearing new shoes. Um, yeah. But then they have their date, right? He she mm -hmm. comes to the lab. He's getting ready to show her the cool thing with the Tesla coil, and we get... I think you'd better step into my cage. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm extremely disappointed in you. I specifically requested that for the intro, and you ignored me. I didn't ignore you. It just, just wasn't long enough. It just wasn't long enough. Oh, oh, okay. So I should try harder next time. But, but uh -huh. I made sure, like, as soon as I heard it, I'm like, well, that's getting captured. Hey, we, we, haven't, we haven't mentioned... The whole thing, okay, so so the story is, we've been through this whole thing, we haven't said this, With the, the, the story is that, okay, so the, so there was Veronica, Balthazar, and, um, and um, Horvath, Horvath. Um, and um, Horshack, and, oh, no, sorry, I'm thinking of the John Wood movie, and uh, hold on, no, that wasn't Horshack, that was, yeah, it was, that was John Travolta. Is he Horshack? Uh, he wasn't, but um, I know what you're Damn talking it, about. Same show. Anyway, well, that's what I get for trying to make a joke. Um, but and so they there there's this ring that imparts power, and whoever whoever like you know it's the sword and the stone, except whoever the ring like attaches to can can wear it and and do this magic. And so Balthazar goes around the there's this there's this montage where Balth Balthazar goes around the world taking this ring and basically saying to people like like sultans and what is implied maybe like the next kid buddha or whatever mm -hmm. surround the world saying basically i'd like you to try my ring and see if it works on you yeah he's trying and to find the the prime it's, it's, yeah try it like but the way it's portrayed it's like he's doing like the antique roadshow international <laughs> Like he's just going up and saying and handing it to people and being like, "Does it work for you?" No, oh, okay. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Like the way I the way I understood that scene was he's he's researching he's he's searching for the prime millennium. He's looking around. Mm -hmm. When he runs into somebody, he offers them the ring. If the ring accepts them, they are the prime millennium. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah, so he just keeps moving around. Um, yeah, it, they they kind of give him like an Indiana Jones thing. I mean, especially with the hat, but they 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 kind of give him an Indiana Jones vibe with that. Like he's like like he's like mm -hmm. you said, doing the research, going around, and you know, obviously he's not just randomly going up to people, but just trying to figure that out. And it had kind of a like it's even in like a sandy sepia tone. A lot of it, yeah, it had very much kind of that that vibe to it mm -hmm. um but that was part of our opening and i i, I liked that yeah um yeah i did too i thought it was great i got some i got some good cage stuff too um, oh thank god i mean all these sound clips and no cage i'm i'm yet. a very thirsty person i don't know we're getting yes there. um yeah. it's all the reason for the show <laughs> when uh when when becky shows up and dave's like you gotta hide you gotta hide and of course balthazar's not going to so he comes up, he's like, oh, you must be, you know, whoever. And, uh, and Dave's like, no, uh, we're, we're just going to leave or, you know, he, you need to leave or whatever. And I just loved, you know what? It's all right. Because I just remembered, I have to go into town to pick up your anti-itch cream. 
<laughs> that was that was great. Yeah. That one was good. Um, I just labeled this one cage noise. So this is him making a weird sound oh. because it's what cage does. Mm-hmm. Ah! <laughs> That's it. But that one, uh, that one made me laugh. Oh, I did. When he meets Dave in the Arcana Cabana, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And you mentioned it earlier oh, where right. like uh-huh. the introduction to him is, you know, this urn was the second, dy- the second emperor of whatever dynasty. Yeah, the main least dynasty. Wife. Yeah, right. Um, like I loved all of that, uh, but then he tells him, "Don't touch anything," and he leaves. And when he comes yeah. back up, everything's going on. And I just loved. What happened to "Don't touch anything"? <laughs> mm-hmm. Speaking um, of Travolta, kind of has a Travolta vibe in that. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. Little bit. Um, I also liked when he when he calls him Dave, and uh, you just get. Yeah, I have something I'd like to show you, Dave. How did you know my name was Dave? Because I can read minds. That's such a good, I can read minds. And then he follows up with, no, it's written on your backpack. Uh, I am a little surprised that he did not get a little more shouty. Like he's, he, he's in this he giant ass subway thing. Mm-hmm. Like he's not, and he's not going to yell at this, at this guy. I mean, like it doesn't even have to be mean. Like, you know, just to say, no, Hey, but- turn the stereo down or whatever, you know, just. But But, I was, but the funny thing was, I wasn't like, I didn't miss that. No, I wasn't disappointed. No, no, no. no. I mean, and and I love a good cage freak out. I love a good, you know, good caging out moment, but um, it worked here because he did get, he got close to it a couple of times. Like I really Mm -hmm. liked. So unless you want him to turn you into a pig who just loves physics, then you better help me find that doll before he does. (laughs) God, that was so great loves physics so yeah got that now um he did slip into that when they so after the the scene in chinatown and then the cops show up and we cut away you know the camera just pans over and then when it pans back they're both they suddenly both look like new york police officers and Mm -hmm. (laughs) it goes into that really bad new york accent he's just between you and me cap i think some of these folks were hitting the saggy pretty hard (laughs) I love that. And I just loved when then Dave corrects him that sake is Japanese and just the look that he gives him of like, dude, like, really? I'm working like really right yeah. now. <laughs> it was so good. It was so good. Um, you know, we had the pointy shoes because mm-hmm. pointy shoes, uh, but also they look like they had the been record, chewed. You wear the old guy's shoes very well. You wear the old guy's shoes very well. They, when, when, when he holds them up, he, he, they kind of look like they've been chewed on by a dog. They look like they have some teeth marks on the soles or something. It may have been. Maybe know. Tank got a hold of them. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Who, Tank, maybe. who's in the movie for some reason, and then we just forget about him. Like, yeah. they mention him being in the, in the car yeah. before the car chase starts, but then never mention him again. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and of course you can't yeah, have the weird choices. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm-hmm. but you can't have a movie with a master and an apprentice without some sort of a whatever, whatever 101. Yeah. Right. So we get, I'm going to give you the basics, strictly sorcery 101. Mm-hmm. Got to have that. Mm-hmm. It's you just, yeah. that's the trope you have to, yep. you're not allowed uh, to not have that. Um, I also did like Persian quick rug. He thinks I'm old fashioned. I I couldn't help but think if I had heard of a Persian quick rug when I was a kid, and there like there had been any sort of leaning into that idea, like anywhere, anything like quicksand. It doesn't even have to be that much, but that that would be an idea that would like. That I've would, never I've never heard the. Oh, get to me! I've never yeah, I've yeah. never heard of that. That's uh, that's uh, that's quite an innovation. I've never heard the phrase um, Persian quick rug, but I've seen that same gag done where you have a rug and the rug um, is in the room and it is the thing that you sink into. Like I've seen that gag oh, done before, right? Yeah. but I've never heard it called the Persian quick rug. But there were a couple of like really good gags like that. Like I liked Balthazar fighting with the, the first fight in Arcana Cabana and Horvath uh, has the um, sword that he's like sword fighting with, but he's sword fighting with his cane remotely mm-hmm. fighting with the sword. I thought that was cool. Like that was right. a fun gag. So, right. 
Also, I want to say something about the Arcana. If I if if I don't care what it is, I I am not fall if if I follow anything into a dusty old crusty store that has doll heads in jars, I'm leaving. Like I'm no no ma'am. I'm not doing that. Uh, like, I mean I I say I would say that, but I, I would go into the store. I would be that kid. So I don't know. It just hit a threshold for me. Um, and then this one, I just, this was too good of an exchange. This is, this was because cage and um, Baruchel, um, had good chemistry. I thought they worked well together as Balthazar and Dave. Mm -hmm. And I just liked, and keep it subtle. Mm -hmm. Civilians mustn't know magic exists. That would be complicated. Says the guy in the 350 year old rawhide trench coat. That was real good. Mm -hmm. That coat was amazing, though. Yeah, that was um, that was a piece of work. So it it's interesting to me, and I talked about this some last week with leaving Las Vegas, and I talked about it with basically every Nick Cage movie. But this is fundamentally across the board not as good of a film or a story as Leaving Las Vegas. Right, like Leaving Las Vegas was an amazing story and it's really good filmmaking and just outstanding acting performances mm -hmm. but i don't ever want to watch it again because it was rough sure. this across the board isn't as good of an art piece mm -hmm. but it was enjoyable and i would watch this again if somebody was like hey i've never seen the sorcerer's apprentice and we're gonna sit down and have a movie night and watch it i'll be like man sure why not i need i can watch this have some popcorn and enjoy the visuals of it because the visuals were really good mm -hmm. Um, really, one of the on, the only effects that I didn't think held up, aside from the particle effects, like I mentioned, is uh, was the quick rug. I thought that looked a little hokey. Um, maybe a little. That's a tough one to do. Yeah. Right, right, so, exactly. And and like and like in the in the the um, nominal sorcerer's apprentice scene with the the um, mops and brooms. Oh and yeah. Oh, I didn't um, even mention that yet. I, that, I have to say that. Like I. Like some of that was obviously CG, but also what are you going to do? Like they, they had yeah. to make them look alive. That's going to look. So, okay. Exactly. The, yeah. <laughs> that scene for me, I think the first part of it where we get a little bit of the musical cue and he starts down that mm -hmm. road of like making a single mop clean up the room was cute. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay. Here's your little nod, okay. And, yeah, and now let's continue. And then with let's this move story. on. But they have the whole no thing much, play but out. They bring out the whole thing. All that had yeah. to go. I'm sorry, but that was that was even, real dumb, even, and it didn't. It just didn't work for me. Like I get even the why, thing where he's. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was just gonna say I get why, and that was clearly uh, somebody saying like, "Oh, we got to have this in here because otherwise, yes. no one will know it's Sorcerer's Apprentice." No, no, you don't need that. That can go. Yeah. Just just get rid of that. It went too long. It went way too long, and it wasn't particularly funny. Yeah, so. like when when like down to when he's trying to chop one of the uh, one of the brooms or mops up, mm -hmm. it does a whole thing about splitting apart that it does in the cartoon. I mean, yeah, all, exactly. all you're missing all you're missing is is an animated mouse going around going, ah, ha, ha, ha. oh yeah, boy, it, it just like. like I'm kind. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that there's not a reference to him somewhere in it. Although well, there is, right? Yeah. There, there is. There is a credit scene that opens on, on the, uh, on the, the titular hat, if you will. Yep. And um, seems to maybe set it up for kind of a sequel, but I couldn't, man. Yeah, couldn't. they were they were sequel baiting that because it's definitely Horbath yeah, grabbing were... his hat, but the movie bombed so hard that they just, uh, yeah. You know, pulled both their hamstrings back and away from it and uh and moved on but yeah right. it's a it's a movie that has a lot of fun elements that didn't come together and it bums me out that it didn't come together better because the people involved are capable of making a better movie it just hit at the wrong time and it was the combination right it's not particularly great but it is entertaining it's not mm -hmm. Um, it, it is missing some cohesion in the story, but it's not unwatchable. Oh, and no. 
on top of that, like the timing of it coming out the week after Despicable Me, which was its target audience is all talking about that and wanting to go see that again. And uh, the the older audiences, you know, all they're talking about is Inception at the time. It's the same yeah. summer. They have that, their think piece. Yeah. Yeah. I think Toy Story 3 was still in theaters at the time. Um, mm. Like there was stuff and it basically Some just hot hit. Disney Disney action. Yeah. It just hit at the wrong time and didn't hit the mark mm-hmm. well enough. Sure. And I do think that, again, Jay Baruchel as your lead, because he's not known yet enough as Hiccup, uh, it's harder to market mm-hmm. him to a younger audience. Cage is one that isn't necessarily marketing to a younger audience, although you still have National mm-hmm. Treasure, so you can at least trade on that. Right. But just there were enough elements that just didn't quite work. But at the same time, Cage is Balthazar. Alfred Molina is always great. He always does so much with whatever he gets. I think Drake, the character of Drake Stone, had potential, but just just mm-hmm. poorly executed. And that's not to- mm-hmm. Toby Kebbell's fault. I don't oh, no. think he wasn't given much. Like, he was given a direction to go in. And he wasn't, he wasn't even given much latitude in what he had. No. And it it was, it was all pretty straightforward. Yeah. He either needed to have much more involvement in the plot or he needed to be one note joke and then gotten Mm -hmm. rid of. Yeah. You know, the way that they did with the, um, the second sorcerer they brought out of the thing, the young girl, the one from the Salem witch trials, Mm -hmm. like to have her show up, do one thing and then gone. That's what they needed. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to do that with Drake or make him much more Mm -hmm. make him be somebody that dave knows they didn't need to establish further that somebody can come out of the the thing and establish themselves as a character because they kind of they kind of just teased with them yeah we're like oh hey again it was like oh hey look at we what we can do isn't that cool okay now over here yeah i think i think if you uh if you have um kids in that sort of i would say 10 to 13 range would be a good age for this one. Um, although I'm terrible at figuring out what ages people should be watching certain things. Cause I was watching all the wrong stuff at way too young of an age. So whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that, uh, this is a fun one. I think kids that grew up with it have a, a much more nostalgic connection to it, which I could completely understand. Yeah. Um, and it's on Disney plus. So if you want to check it out, it's not, it's not unwatchable. It's not terrible. It's just no. go into it with lowered expectations if, and enjoy yeah, the spectacle of it. Enjoy the set pieces because it looks so cool. Yeah. If you're willing to put up with the BS that is a bad movie, there's so much entertainment there mm-hmm. that it's worth at least giving it a shot. At least like try the first, I, honestly, try the first like 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And and it's so funny. Literally earlier today on um on threads, I want to say it was Gary Witta, somebody was was posting where somebody else had said that, oh, you shouldn't start a movie with somebody waking up. And he was like, Wait, that actually is a valid plot device <laughs> a lot of the time. Here it was it was so they could show Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. Um <laughs> Gotta have those and, tie-ins. Yeah, there's freaking it's it's fun though. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. It, it, it really is. And I don't know. I mean, like I say, it's on Disney plus, you know, you give I it a shot. It twice. I could rewatch it a month from now. And like, it, and it's just, it's just fun. Yeah. And everybody involved is having fun too. Oh, for sure. So that goes a long way. Like Nick Cage wants to be there and he's having a good time. And Alfred Molina is having a great time playing Horvath. And, and Dave is a fun, uh, is having a fun time. You know, Jay Baruchel is like, everybody's having a good time making it. So it's definitely worth a watch. Um, if you're into this kind, if you don't want, if you don't like magic in your movies, and I know certain people that just don't care for like fantasy like that, skip it. It's fine. But if you do, it's worth a, you know, it's worth sitting down and watching. I think, I think it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I've seen far worse and I've seen worse cage movies. I've seen Mm -hmm. Nicholas cage movies that are, are a little bit more boring. I always will find something enjoyable in a Nick cage movie. Um, Mm -hmm. but I would put this in the upper half 
Uh, there's, there, there's a lot of them um, that I might watch again. This one I certainly would if somebody wanted to watch it. Like, no problem. So, but yeah, Cage Palooza is rolling on. Um, now, next week, uh, I'm going in a different direction. Next episode, I've got Stephen Izzy from the Everything I Learned from Movies podcast. And we are going to watch another Nicolas Cage movie. It's our final movie for Cage Palooza. We're going to watch Joe. Uh, I know nothing about this movie other than uh, it's written or it's directed by David Gordon Green, which I did not know until uh, we scheduled it for this. But it's got uh, Nick Cage and Ty Sheridan in it. An ex-con who is the unlikeliest of role models meets a 15 year old boy and is faced with the choice of redemption or ruin. Um, I hear good things about this one. So I'm kind of excited. Um, and it's going in a very different direction from something like The Sorcerer's Apprentice. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll be, that'll be a fun one to do. Uh, so that's, what's coming up next episode to wrap mm-hmm. up cage of Palooza, um, for this year, followed by, I will be at dragon con this year. Uh, so if you're going to be in Atlanta for dragon con, come to gallery of six on Friday night at eight 30. And, uh, you'll get to watch a live episode of wait. You haven't seen where I am making my friends, Charles McFall and Phil Keating sit down and talk to me about the borderlands movie. Um, <sighs> Mercy. So this should be this should get interesting what? it might get a little spicy yeah. uh so because if i know phil i know he's got he's got some very strong feelings about the borderlands movies um mm. so uh it'll, it'll be fun oh, that's coming up it's one that, of those that, no, i'm just kidding <laughs> that's coming up <laughs> on uh, uh in the next couple of episodes here um so if you if you can make it live and that will be streamed on the dragon con um digital media twitch channel as well so if you can't make it to dragon con you can check the you can catch the live stream there and then of course it'll be in the feeds which the show the feeds um new episodes hit on wednesdays uh anywhere you get your podcasts or tv's travis.com leaving a, a rating and a review uh does help so i do appreciate that i've also got um at tv's travis.com you can find merchandise um like uh shirts hats i do have a wonderful shirt um in commemoration of episode 200 i did with uh, my friend drew uh where we watched zardoz so you don't have to uh, i have those shirts on the site as well and there's a patreon patreon.com slash wyhs um for right now as little as one dollar an episode i'm gonna have to change things though to a monthly um from per episode uh because of some changes at um at patreon, patreon. but uh for for very little, you can help to support the show that way and make things like the live Dragon Con episodes possible. That is possible because of patrons, because the wonderful folks that have backed the show helped me to pay uh, my way to Dragon Con. So I appreciate you so much, including a stigma who is a new newer patron. Um, and I had not mentioned that yet. A stigma. Thank you so much uh, for being a patron. Um, Jonathan, you do some fantastic chain mail art. Well, thank you. Yes, I do. Uh, you can go to axolettuce.com. You can see tons and tons of examples of my work. Pretty soon should have a store back up. Having to do inventory the way I uh, the way I make stuff has always been kind of vexing for me. But I think I've I think I've uh, I I think I've settled on something. And so yeah, you, uh, maybe maybe it'll be up by. The time you hear this, so go to extralettuce.com, hit me up on the socials at extra lettuce or extra lettuce at gmail.com if you want some of your very own shiny, shiny stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, until next week, next episode, because I'm actually going to be recording it a little bit early, but next episode and Joe with Stephen Izzy, uh, just remember to enjoy your movies. Jonathan, thank you for being here. Uh, this has been Wait for Gavin. Knuckle bump. Happening. This is not happening. I taste sour in my mouth. Glavin. <laughs> I taste sour in my mouth.